Good morning. I was so eager to come to this panel. I wanted to show up early, so I came yesterday. But I knew where I had to go. Muy buenos dias. So we're going to talk about dig digital resiliency and emergencies. Digital training basic skills. I am joined by Minister Omar Paganini, Minister of Industry, Energy, and Mining of Uruguay, and Rodrigo Quedelima, he's the president for Latin America Microsoft. Thank you for joining us. Now, we're talking about digital resiliency and how to cope with, the, with emergencies. And I think the perfect example of what we're facing today was brought by the pandemic. Now, President Lacalle Pou was going to join us today, and he couldn't travel. He tested positive for COVID. And now the minister is here, and we're going to talk about how these two years changed everything and showed how important infrastructure is, how important technology is, how important the human factor is, and the fact that we've been able to prove that we can work from home, but we can work from home only if we have the basic technology to do so. So I wanted to start asking you, uh, Minister Paganini, where do you see the work between the public sector and the private sector, and how has the infrastructure of Uruguay, you have 90% fiber optic coverage for internet. You have um, very solid 4G coverage. How has that helped you during the pandemic and how has it allowed Uruguay to move into this new phase? Okay, well, thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Uh, the example is very good because actually what happened in Uruguay is that we had a solid infrastructure, but we also had good advancement in the government. And when the pandemic arrived, we could build an integrated information system for the pandemic. All the electronic uh, clinical records of the citizens in a centralized database, integrated with all the healthcare providers, and an app, an, an application that was developed in re time, record time where you could first get information of how the pandemic was advancing, but then you could report symptoms, then you could get follow-up of your treatment. And later on, we added the vaccination campaign to the app. So every citizen from the president to, to the last of the small children in the interior of the country had to schedule their vaccination through the app. And we achieved a, a record time vaccination of the whole population with an integrated system using digital technology. So that's an example how digital is a keystone for resilience, as you said. Also, in the education system, we have Seibal. That is one laptop per child, internet connectivity for all children in the public school system. And that allowed us not to close down the education system during the first year of the pandemic. Of course, there were very big challenges, and we had to go very quickly to 90% usage of Ceibal, it was before that 5%. Because, well, we had to move online with lots of challenges to skill the teachers, to take advantage of it. But it's a very good example of how a, a country like Uruguay, which is not very big, which is with a very wide coverage of infrastructure, can use this for resiliency. Rodrigo, we have the private sector, we have the public sector, you have the infrastructure, but you need the tools to use that infrastructure. How is that working and where are we now in those pu public-private partnerships to build up resilience and to face these challenges? So first, during, the, during COVID, uh, technology was a critical factor for people to stay connected and for the government to work, kids to, to study. Uh, so we saw a, a huge increase uh, in our platform teams uh, that has more than 200 uh, uh, users uh, in, in, in they were used by the first responders, was used in schools, was used by the companies. What COVID showed is that we have to accelerate uh, digital transformation of the governments. And we have a great example actually with uh, Uruguay. We're very close to announce a, um, a new IoT uh, in AI lab in Uruguay. We're going to announce very soon, we already agreed on it. Um, it's gonna be the third um, lab uh, in the world. We have in, in Shanghai and in Munich. 
and the only reason we are doing this is because we wanted to accelerate the development in, uh, in Uruguay. Uh, today, innovation and creation happens everywhere, not just in the big cities in, in the very large countries. And you have a lot of talent, a lot of infrastructure and conditions in Uruguay uh, to do this. Now, Minister, you're mentioning Uruguay, a small country with, if you, can, if you compare it with other countries in the region, a smaller population, but how were you able to have such a high penetration of fiber optics? How were you able to keep this infrastructure? Because this isn't new. I remember talking about this many years ago. There's been um, a goal of having this infrastructure. And how do you think Uruguay, the model of Uruguay, could help bigger countries that have challenges much greater than, than what you have? Well, there has been, uh, from one administration to the other, a continuity in investment in, in infrastructure. It's really, what you said in the first question, I did not stress it, a public-private endeavor because the, the telephone companies have invested in infrastructure. One of them is state-owned, Antel, and we are proud to say that Antel is a leader in this kind of thing. So there was a drive forward from the telephone operators. There was a, a, a normative, a regulatory push from the government. There is an agency for electronic government. The, inside this agency, this unified healthcare system was developed. Guidelines for e-government around the whole state uh, structure have been put in place. And the providers from the technology sector are 100% private and they are uh, in a way partners many developments. Microsoft is one of them. Uh, this app, I told, was built by 15 Uruguayan startups, joined around one of them in one month. So uh, there is a very good ecosystem in Uruguay. Joining public stimulus, tax, uh, tax uh, exemptions, uh, a national agency for, for uh, innovation that gives grants, and an ecosystem that has been built for 30 years, we're now exporters and software, so that we profited from all of that. Uh, the general recipe, I cannot say, but of course there's always public investment in infrastructure, an ecosystem uh, with tools to promote it, international companies coming and taking part of this ecosystem in an open way, and that is more or less the recipe. And how we were talking before we came on the stage, how the president, La Calle Pau, wasn't able to come, but he's probably watching this, so, Lo saludamos, Presidente. Eh, sabemos que está escuchando todo. Rodrigo, when you open, when you create the system, when you have to go up, you also face challenges like cyber attacks. What are the steps taken to try to prevent, if not avoid, being paralyzed by these cyber threats? Yeah, you, you have always to be ahead and invest heavily in development and training, just to give you a sizing of what is happening in terms of cyber attacks. We do monitor a very large number of computers, devices, data centers everywhere, right? So in 2019, we, we identified three trillion signals. Not necessarily an attack, but could be an attack, so signals. Yes. In 2020, the first year of the pandemic, uh, the number went to eight trillions. And in 2021, it went to 24 trillion. So it is an exponential increase uh, in, in the cyber attacks. They're becoming more and more sophisticated. They're completely cross-border. Uh, so the only solution to stop this is invest heavily. We have committed to invest $20 billion uh, until 2025, just in cyber. Uh, we have been working with governments across the planet on on, because it's not just about the technology, it's about the process, it's about the, the people getting, uh, being trained. Uh, so it is, it is a hard work. This is likely to be cybersecurity and privacy are like to be, likely to be the, the, the challenge of the next decade for everyone. Minister, you are the Minister of Industry, Energy and Mining. What we're seeing now, is this creating opportunities for in global tech to be the future mining, to be the future of exploration, to be the future of creating opportunities for growth? We are very convinced it is. And we have put a lot of 
our energy in developing what we call Uruguay as an innovation hub. Uruguay is a business hub for the Southern Cone for many years. We have an innovation uh, record that is good and we want to go one step forward and turn this into an innovation hub for the region, attracting also talent, attracting investment, attracting startups. But this kind of initiative Rodrigo was saying of, uh, for example, an AI and IoT lab is the kind of thing we want to do so that the, the ecosystem can profit from advanced labs and go in next, the next step into the new technologies that is artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, and also the, the cybersecurity challenge that Rodrigo was saying. So we think we have an opportunity. We have a good record in innovation in technology and infrastructure. We want to move on that forward and also with a regional mindset. And this lab is also with a regional mindset. Rodrigo, is Uruguay a good example because you have the technology, you have the infrastructure, but do you have the human talent? Because you can have the infrastructure, but if you don't have the human talent and you don't develop it, then you, are, you're, you have one hand tied behind your back. Yeah, you, you do have the infrastructure, you do have a business-friendly environment, and you do have a lot of talent. But let me, let me make sure we, we all talk about talent, because talent is a challenge everywhere in technology. We say that today, uh, technology as part of the GDP is about 5%, and it's going to grow to 10% uh, in 2030, so it's going to double. From a GDP perspective, that's a lot. What, why this is happening? Because companies are, are, are not just using technology, they're becoming technology companies. I used to make a joke about talent, about training, that coding is going to be the new math which means that it's becoming so important and so part of everything we do that we're gonna see kids at some point having a mandatory class on coding. And uh, we believe we have the, the right combination uh, in Uruguay, that's why we're, we're putting the lab there. But it's still a lot of work to do and it's still a lot to catch up because the demand for technical talent for, uh, for digital skills is much higher than, than what we're producing every year. Minister, you mentioned something I thought was very interesting, how the pandemic made the country implement computer for, for, for child, the access to internet, the access to education. Is this tech for good? And is this where you're seeing a new transformation of all these children that are growing up with the access to a laptop, with the access to the internet, with a new way, as Rodrigo was saying, of learning? Because now, at least here in the States, kids are aware and they want to learn coding. I say it from my son in school, he's in high school, they want to do it and it's becoming something that everyone sees as an opportunity. Is this where you see this going? Yes, of course, uh, I have to be clear here. In 2007, we started with a one laptop per child program. Uh, then it evolved into also adding e-learning platform to the system. But what happened in the pandemic is that the usage of all these e-learning platforms and the usage of connectivity from the schools, boom, exploded. And this is the way to go because these, guys, these, these children are digital natives. And when they get out of high school or of midterm uh, mid school, they have the digital abilities. So we will see, I am convinced in Uruguay, an explosion of digital talent in the next years because they are already youngsters and they are getting into, into the workspace uh, quickly. But we have, as Rodrigo said, a very big challenge because the, the demand for talent in digital skills is global and it's enormous. Uh, but we also have to be, bear in mind that it is also a way to integrate people from different parts uh, of the region so we can take profit also if we have an innovation hub in Uruguay from talent all around the region and not necessarily working in Uruguay, digital nomads, uh, that, but we have to put a lot of efforts in upskilling and reskilling people, of course. But, and let me add that the, the impact in inclusion is huge because the minute that you give uh, people that uh, don't have a condition, you give them access to internet and laptop, uh, technology today is democratizing you know, everything. So today a kid sitting anywhere with a computer has almost the same access to technology and tools that are Fortune 500. So, so when you get a smart kid 
and you give the conditions, you give them the chance to grow and to develop and to change their situation of, you know, himself and the family. And we're talking about the children, but let's talk about the parents, about training them, about getting people to learn these new skills. How do you go about training the labor market to take advantage of these new technologies? Yeah, the, the first thing is to convince people that they have to change, they have to reskill, that they have to learn. Sometimes you need to unlearn to learn. Uh, people at a certain age might say, you know, I've, I have been working 30 years, so I can't learn this, and, and you can. And that's where the economy is going. And that's the only solution at the end, because we're not going to have, we have more open positions than people. So the only way to solve the gap in talent is by reskilling people. And today you do have tools and technology to accelerate learning and training. You have, I have cases where uh, the person was, after 35 years of work uh, on retail, decided to learn cyber in 18 months. After 18 months of training, got a job in cyber, and it's gonna get better every day. So, so I think uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to convince people that's where the opportunity is and that's where the need is. Ministro, where is Uruguay? Where do you want Uruguay to be in this digital transformation? Uruguay has done quite a few things well. Infrastructure, all these platforms I, say, I said, we have a dynamic ecosystem that is exporting IT services to the world, to the US. We have startups, we have international companies in Uruguay. We have, and we want to have more development centers, international centers in Europe, and we think we're going to go to be the innovation hub of the region. And that's, that's where we're going. And of course, we have a lot of challenges. This kind of initiative from Microsoft to install a lab there goes in that correct direction, in our opinion. We're very happy with it. We have other initiatives also on the pipeline. Uh, and we have to, face the skilling, the skill question that Rodrigo was saying, upskilling, reskilling with many different tools, not only the formal education system, also uh, boot camps, uh, private and public partnerships. But we are confident that maybe in five years, Uruguay can be the innovation hub of the region. We'll see. Thank you very much. Minister, Ministro Omar Paganini is the Minister of Industry, Energy and Mining for Uruguay. Rodrigo Quede Lima, is a president for Latin America, Microsoft. Thank you both. Very good luck in the World Cup. Oh, we'll oh. be watching. Yeah, <laughs> more time. But... Well, I'm not sure who will have the luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Muchas gracias.